Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and um, good morning or good evening according to your uh, timeline in different areas in, in the world. Uh, my name is Dr. Amal Albihani. I'm a consultant hematologist and the vice president of Saudi Society for uh, Blood Disorders. And uh, on behalf of uh, Saudi Society for Blood Disorders, I would like to welcome you all to our annual uh, Saudi Hematology Congress, uh, which is being run this year as uh, what's happening all over the world as uh, uh, virtual. And, and uh, we are glad to have that some, to some extent uh, because by, by having it virtual, actually we have more uh, people uh, with the chance to attend this conference. We have uh, more than 20,000 registered uh, to this conference and at different time uh, around 11,000 to 12,000 attendees at uh, different times. Uh, it's my uh, really a great pleasure to, to extend my appreciation and thank to the organizing committee, the scientific committee, and to all participants uh, to who make it uh, and hopefully uh, make it a successful conference. We wish everybody have a successful conference. Today is our day three of the Congress and day two of our hematologic malignancies. Uh, we will be having uh, two sessions uh, today. Uh, uh, each session will be by, moderated uh, by a different moderator. Uh, our first session will be... Uh, it will be a great honor to present the first moderator, Dr. Amar Abdul Wahab. Dr. Amar Abdul Wahab is a consultant, hematologist, and bone marrow transplantation. She's a Executive Director of uh, Oncology Center at King Abdullah Medical City. The second session will be uh, moderated by Dr. John uh, Abostadius. He's a consultant hematologist and bone marrow transplant at uh, King Fahad uh, Hospital, uh, Damma. So please, Dr. Amal, uh, uh, I will give you the floor to introduce the first speaker. Uh -huh. Thank you, Dr. Amal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon, everybody. We are starting the third day, third session of annual Saudi Hematology Congress. Uh, in spite the restriction all over the world, uh, we are still able to communicate and share knowledge. Our first speaker, uh, Dr. Philip Boro, is a professor of clinical hematology and head of translational research program in hematology and oncology at the University of uh, Hospital Nantes, France. Professor Moreau's clinical interests are focused on multiple myeloma and its treatment with high dose therapy and novel agent. So, la parole est à vous. Welcome. Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and, uh, and good afternoon. Um, uh, we are going to speak about uh, uh, how to cure myeloma patients and uh, are we going to reach uh, this goal of curing patients? Uh, so first of all, uh, you can here see my disclosures. And this is the uh, official definition of cure, in fact. Um, curing, it means that you are no longer receiving any treatment and that your residual life expectancy will become identical uh, to that uh, patient, po to a population uh, without uh, multiple myeloma. And uh, in fact, uh, we don't have to receive any treatment. That's a very, very important point. Maintenance and receiving a long-term treatment is not cure at all. So this is very important to keep in mind. And uh, when you are looking at some data, what is the re residual life expectancy at the age of 65? Uh, usually, uh, all over the world now, uh, the majority of the, of the people are, uh, have a residual life expectancy of 20 years. 
So when you are at the age of 65 with a multiple myeloma, if you want to be cured, you have to live up to the age of 84 without any treatment. When you are looking at, uh, this is, these are the data from the uh, US uh, uh, population, uh, the residual life expectancy at 65 years is 20 years again, and at the age of 75 years, the residual life expectancy is 12 years. So it means that if you have a multiple myeloma at the age of 75 and you uh, want to be cured of your myeloma, you have to live up to the age of 87 without any treatment. So are we able now to reach these goals uh, with the treatment uh, uh, with all options that are available? In fact, let's focus on first on patients not eligible for autologous stem cell transplantation, elderly patients, and those patients are representing two-thirds of our patients. This, this is the uh, 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 picture of the recent EHA and ESMO guidelines that were published a few weeks ago. And when you are looking at the uh, frontline treatment, uh, for patients that are not eligible for autologous stem cell transplantation. What are the best options? What are the first options? We are proposing three options. VRD, bortezomib Lendex, followed by Lendex, or VNP plus daratumumab, or Lendex daratumumab. And what is the outcome, in fact? What will be the survival of those elderly patients when they are treated uh, with these three options. Can we think about curing some elderly patients with these three options? First of all, the VRD regimen, VRD followed by Lendex, was uh, tested in a randomized study comparing Lendex versus VRD uh, and published by Brian Dury in The Lancet uh, in 2017. And when the paper was first reported, you see that there is uh, improvement uh, in the progression-free survival with VRD uh, in red. Uh, the median PFS is 43 months, but there is really no plateau on the PFS curve. And when you are looking at overall survival, the median OS is 75 months. So that's something like six years with VRD followed by Lendex and no plateau on OS curve. It means that if you have uh, if you are uh, diagnosed with multiple myeloma at the age of 75, then with VRD, you will be alive up to the age of 81, and then probably you are not going to be cured at all. The study was updated uh, recently in Blood Cancer Journal, and uh, with a longer follow-up, we have exactly the same results, in fact, indicating that the median OS is something like six years with VRD followed by Lendex. What, what about uh, the second option that is proposed in elderly patients? That VMP, bortezomib, melphalan, and prednisone, plus daratumumab, based on the results of the Alcione study, published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. VMP versus VMP-DARA, followed by DARA maintenance uh, on 700 patients. The primary endpoint was PFS. Uh, with a long follow-up, uh, we have now these results in terms of PFS. You see uh, with a median follow-up of more than three years, the hazard ratio is 0.4 in favor of VMP plus DARA. That is a very a good option, but the median PFS is three years, 36 months. And when looking at overall survival, there is also an OS benefit with VMP DARA. So definitely, it is one of the first options that is now proposed to our patients. But you see, no plateau on the overall survival curve. Nevertheless, we can anticipate that the OS will be something like eight years in median with VMP DARA. And that's, that's very, very uh, important. And that's a very uh, important progress, to my opinion. But the best combination available for elderly patients is DRD, Lendex plus daratumumab, based on the Maya study 
more than 730 patients were randomized into the study. And when uh, the paper was published uh, in the New England, uh, we uh, saw that uh, more than 40% of the patients were older than 75 years of age. So we have here an elderly patient population. The median age was 73 in Tumaya. And when looking at the PFS at the time of the first report, uh, the median PFS was not reached. The hazard ratio is 0.56 in favor of the triplet combination. And the Lendex arm is doing very well with a median PFS of 32 months. So we can anticipate to have a very long PFS. And when focusing on patients older than 75 years, uh, the subgroup analysis is also showing that the benefit is not restricted for to uh, the younger uh, population of patients enrolled in that study, but that's also true for very elderly uh, patients. You see uh, on the right hand side of the slide, the clear benefit of DRD versus Lendex in very elderly patients. So definitely this combination is the best to my opinion. And when we are looking at update analysis on responses, and also on MRD negativity rate, you see that we have a high rate of MRD negativity uh, with uh, DARA, Lendex, and we also have this concept of sustained MRD negativity over time, but you see that the number of patients remaining MRD negative is decreasing uh, when we are following those patients. It means that probably we all patients are going to relapse despite this very effective uh, combination. And at ASH, a few weeks ago, Dr. Kumar did update the Maya results. And with a follow-up of four years, we can now anticipate to have a PFS, a median PFS, that will be 55 plus. And that's the best PFS ever reported. But nevertheless, no plateau. And we can think of having uh, median overall survival uh, of something like 10 years uh, when patients will receive Daral Index. And definitely, some patients are not going to die from multiple myeloma, but probably from other causes, uh, such as cardiac disease, for example. Uh, it means that with DRD, we are reaching a very, very long survival, even in patients above the 75 years, and definitely, uh, that's the best regimen available, to my opinion. But in conclusion, for patients not eligible for autologous stem cell transplantation, the cure is very unlikely. But based on the PFS uh, data achieved with DRD, we will have, for sure, a significant improvement in overall survival. So what about now patients that are eligible for autologous stem cell transplantation, younger patients? one third of them. Cure means to reach the best response and to have a sustained response. And when we are looking again at the uh, European recent ESMO guidelines published a few weeks ago, you see that we are proposing for those patients an induction that is based on the triplet VRD combination or VTD Dara plus daratumumab, followed by stem cell transplantation, followed by lenalidomide maintenance for all patients. And when uh, we are discussing about frontline stem cell transplantation, we are systematically proposing this strategy for younger patients. And why we are considering that in 2021, frontline stem cell transplantation is the standard of care. This is based on three studies, the IFM 2009, the EMNO2, and the Forte study. Uh, the IFM study looked at VRD versus VRD plus stem cell transplantation, followed by one year maintenance in the two arms of the study. The progression free survival was recently updated at ASH a few weeks ago with a very long follow up. And definitely, PFS is improved with VRD plus autologous stem cell transplantation. And interestingly, when looking at MRD negativity, uh, tested in a subgroup of patients into the study, overall survival is improved both before maintenance and after one year of maintenance when MRD is negative, indicating that 
neg MRD negativity is associated with a very good outcome and a better overall survival. So definitely, MRD negativity should be the goal of our treatment for young patients. So interestingly, in the study, when you are looking at RMB, VRD, and stem cell transplantation, and one year of maintenance, after a follow-up of eight years, one third of the patients did not relapse. So definitely, this is a very good platform, VRD, stem cell transplantation, one year of maintenance. This is the platform, in fact, when we would like to cure some patients. The second study showing that frontline stem cell transplantation is the standard of care is the EMNO2 study comparing VCD and stem cell transplantation versus VCD and VMP and no stem cell transplantation up front. And with a very long follow-up, uh, there is an overall survival benefit uh, for patients who did receive VCD uh, plus stem cell transplantation as reported at ASH 2020 by Dr. Michele Cavo. When we are looking at the Forte study that was also presented uh, at ASH recently, Carfield Lendex KRD followed by stem cell transplantation in blue was compared with KRD alone without stem cell transplantation in green. And you see that the best progression free survival is also achieved with KRD and stem cell transplantation. So we have here the backbone, in fact, of uh, the, uh, the treatment of uh, young patients. But how to improve on these results since we are uh, considering that the PFS uh, curve is no showing any plateau? We would like to uh, improve those results. And one way is to add a monoclonal antibody to the triplet induction uh, in order to increase the response rate and improve uh, the PFS. So that was the goal of the Cassiope study, and we did compare prospectively VTD, four cycles, bortezomib, thalidomide, and dexamethasone before and two cycles after stem cell transplantation with or without daratumumab, uh, the CD38 antibody, on more than 1,000 patients. The paper was published in the Lancet, and you see that the responses are really high and the responses are deepening over time after each step of the strategy, after induction, after stem cell transplantation, after consolidation. And the responses were really higher, much higher in the daratumumab arm of the study. Uh, we looked at MRD negativity by flow cytometry, and the uh, rate of MRD negativity was 64% uh, uh, with DARA VTD versus 44% uh, when we looked at VTD alone. And this depth of response translated into a better progression free survival. And you see that uh, in a, this phase three study, the PFS uh, data are really outstanding in the DARA arm of the study with a hazard ratio less than 0.5. And uh, uh, Interestingly, based on this DARA VTD PFS data, this quadruplet combination was approved by FDA, by EMA, and is used in routine in many countries all over the world. When we are focusing on patients reaching MRD negativity before maintenance, you see here the uh, incredible uh, results of the PF for PFS with DARA VTD in MRD negative patients. 64% of the patients did reach MRD negativity in the DARA arm. And you see definitely that there are very, very few events. And uh, interestingly as well, uh, despite the use of daratumumab and the quadruplet combination, when we are looking at high risk disease, you see standard risk in yellow with DARA VTD and in green, high risk with DARA VTD. So definitely DARA is improving the outcome of both subgroups, standard risk and high risk as well, as compared with VTD. But we are not able to overcome the poor prognosis of high risk cytogenetics. So for those patients with high risk, even with quadruplet uh, treatment plus stem cell transplantation, probably we are not going to cure them. This depth of response, this PFS results, 
are translating, uh, although the data are not mature, uh, into a better overall survival. There is only a trend for a better overall survival. We need a longer follow-up, but nevertheless, uh, the uh, hazard ratio is less than 0.5 in favor of the uh, quadruplet combination. And you see that at 20 months, after two years, 97% of the patients are alive when we are using a quadruplet and stem cell transplantation. We also looked at MRD negativity after induction, after four cycles. And you see that with DARA VTD, one, more than one third of the patients are reaching MRD negativity uh, with DARA VTD versus 23% only with VTD alone. And this factor uh, was a very important one to uh, predict the outcome of patients. When we are looking at the multivariate analysis of prognostic factors, in fact, into the study, uh, the treatment group uh, is the most important prognostic factor for PFS. So receiving DARA is associated with a better PFS. But also, interestingly, reaching MRD negativity after induction and before stem cell transplantation is also a very important prognostic factor, indicating that Importantly, we should look at MRD negativity, but immediately after induction, we are able to predict the outcome when patients are MRD negative. And it's uh, important to reach MRD negativity, not only before maintenance, but very early uh, after uh, induction. And this is the outcome uh, of patients MRD negative uh, uh, after induction. Uh, in the DARA arm of the study, and definitely that's the best arm uh, into the study. So it is important to reach, as I mentioned, MRD negativity before maintenance, but also uh, after uh, induction. Why not using, instead of VTD, VRD, lenalidomide, uh, instead of thalidomide, and adding daratumumab into this quadruplet VRD DARA, uh, that was tested as well in the randomized fashion uh, in the Griffin study published last year, but by uh, Dr. Voris from the US. Uh, Griffin study uh, enrolled more than 200 patients only in the US. A prospective comparison of VRD both before and after stem cell transplantation with or without daratumumab. So the study design is very similar to that of Cassiope, but instead of using thalidomide, we are using lenalidomide. And definitely when you are looking at the MRD negativity before maintenance, MRD negativity rates with VRD DARA and stem cell transplantation, 44% of the patients uh, as compared with 14% with VRD alone. So definitely DARA VRD is improving uh, MRD negativity rates at the end of the consolidation and before maintenance. But to demonstrate that VRD DARA is the best regimen and to my opinion will become standard of care in the future, we need a phase three randomized study. And this study is currently proposed by the uh, European consortium EMN. All patients are already enrolled into the study. That's a phase three uh, trial. And we need uh, a long follow-up and we are awaiting for those very important results. Uh, maybe we can improve not only with the addition of a monoclonal antibody during the induction part or during the consolidation part of the strategy, but maybe we can also improve on the maintenance phase. And you know that lenalidomide maintenance is standard of care, but why not using two drugs instead of one? And we have some data now with a two drug maintenance. I showed you the design of the Griffin study, and in this phase two study, in the VRD arm, all patients did receive LEN maintenance. But in the DARA arm of the study, patients did receive the combination of lenalidomide and daratumumab. So a CD38 antibody plus LEN. And definitely, the responses and the quality of the response is increasing during maintenance as well, based on these two drug combination. Uh, you see here the uh, uh, PFS data and overall survival data into Griffin 
And in purple, you see the PFS analysis of Dara BRD. So really outstanding results as well, uh, with more than 95% of the patients uh, that did not relapse, in fact, uh, with a follow-up of more than two years. And the sustained MRD negativity rate is also much higher when we are using during maintenance two drugs instead of one. We also recently heard about the maintenance part of the Forte study that looked at KRD in the setting of stem cell transplantation. And into Forte, there was a second randomization of LEN maintenance for all patients versus LEN plus carfilzomib. Uh, so we know that there is a synergy when we are combining an imid plus a proteasome inhibitor. So this study is, uh, was recently uh, reported at ASH. And you see that the progression-free survival from the time of the second randomization to LEN alone in yellow versus LEN plus carfilzomib in blue, definitely there is a benefit of two drugs instead of one. And this is true for all subgroups of patients. All subgroups, including patients with high-risk cytogenetics, are benefiting from two drug maintenance. And while well, carfilzomib uh, is not probably the best agent because that's an IV drug and we need definitely maintenance that are very convenient with LEN, that is an oral uh, drug, plus maybe an oral proteasome inhibitor or a CD38 antibody sub-Q uh, like we can use with daratumumab. And this is the current Spanish study looking after stem cell transplantation at LEN alone or LEN plus ixazomib. We are here combining an imid plus an oral proteasome inhibitor and we are awaiting for these uh, results that will be presented uh, potentially at the next ASH meeting. So when we want to cure patients, we need to achieve a very good response. And I show you that with a quadruplet combination, maybe with two agents during maintenance after stem cell transplantation, the PFS curves are very, very high. And for standard risk patients, maybe we can reach uh, this uh, holy grail of cure. But we need to have a sustained MRD negativity. The goal is not only to reach MRD negativity, but this has to be uh, uh, maintained uh, uh, over time. And this is uh, the definition, the current definition of sustained MRD negativity uh, according to the International Myeloma Working Group. Sustained MRD negative patients are patients negative in the bone marrow uh, at 10 to the minus 5 with a confirmation uh, minimum of one year apart. So sequentially, you have to assess MRD negativity uh, with two uh, different time points, one year apart. And this is the CML concept. You know, that's one of my patients uh, with CML treated with Glivec. He did achieve uh, a very good response and he was in molecular CR. And after five years, uh, when the molecular CR was maintained, we could stop Glivec and the patient did not relapse, in fact. This is exactly the concept that we would like to reach uh, for multiple myeloma patients. And this is the example of what was proposed into the master study, a phase two trial reported at ASH two years ago. Patients were treated with a quadruplet combination, carfil lendex daratumumab, a very effective one. MRD was assessed after induction and after stem cell transplantation and after consolidation with four additional cycles of KRD DARA. And when MRD was negative twice consecutively after induction and stem cell transplantation or after stem cell transplantation and four uh, causes, cycles of consolidation, the treatment was stopped. This is a phase two study. Few patients were enrolled, but when you are looking at the results after induction, 40% of the patients are reaching MRD negativity. And after stem cell transplantation, it is increasing up to 73%. So with two consecutive MRD negativity assessment, the treatment was stopped for 40% of the patients. And according to Dr. Costa, uh, the paper is not yet published, but no patients did relapse when uh, in the, those patients were 
uh, twice consecutively MRD negative. So this is an MRD driven strategy. And that, uh, to my opinion, is also the future of myeloma therapy. So this is the uh, uh, French study uh, that we are currently uh, 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 running and enrolling patients. We are using a quadruplet combination with KRD and Izatuximab, six cycles. And when patients are MRD negative, and we think that half of the patients will reach MRD negativity, patients will be randomized to no stem cell transplantation, but a very aggressive consolidation and a maintenance with a fixed duration of three years versus stem cell transplantation and LEN maintenance during three years. And we are going to assess uh, each year MRD negativity and the treatment will be stopped. So maybe uh, in arm A and arm B of the study, we will have a significant number, uh, we will have a significant number of patients that will not relapse and potentially they will be cured with an aggressive strategy of a quadruplet combination with or without stem cell transplantation, with a good consolidation and with a long maintenance with lenalidomide. So to conclude, I would say that for uh, patients that are eligible for uh, autologous stem cell transplantation, yes, we can think of curing patients in five years from now, especially those patients with a standard risk disease, with a quadruplet induction and stem cell transplantation, with the goal of achieving MRD negativity very early after induction, and potentially with a maintenance that will be based in the future on two agents instead of one. And I thank you for your very kind attention.